All right. Um, let's talk about the plan really quick. So you'll probably already see that I won't be here on Thursday since this is a, a travel to Texas for the NSF Peaks meeting. Uh, there's a winter storm on Thursday, so I don't know what's going to happen on that day yet. He has something else to work on, so he's not going, and me and Sarah are going. Um, and I'm pretty excited about, yeah. <laughs> yes, you are going. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. See uh, new people and um, making connections, which is great. Where does Texas Austin? Austin? Oh. Uh, Sam, I couldn't pronounce, I forgot the names, uh, 40 minutes from, from Austin, Texas State. Is there a Texas somewhere State. That, that Peaks is called writing? Sea water? Yeah. Did you say Texas? No, it's, um, uh, it's a pram, it's not Peaks actually. Pram is, uh, uh the material science window for ISF and mm -hmm. there are, I don't know, like 10 to 20 sites mm -hmm. in the country, so, uh, Peaks is what, so the prime site, uh, of Forest College mm -hmm. and Boulder. All right, so I have to travel on Thursday, um, and I have another travel in late February, which is super important for me and for the department, um, but I haven't put it on the schedule yet. I will let you guys know. I already booked the flights. No, it's uh, ISSCC. Oh. I, I uh, paid for a week-long uh, tutorials and all the conferences uh, meetings as well. Are you going to MRS also? Not yet, probably. It's a peaks retreat, I think. So I have to go. It's in April, I think. Oh, the is going to that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's super expensive to, to go to San Francisco. I mean, if you are interested, or anybody else, if you are interested, I think there's funding for, uh, from the college can support you to do that. No, I mean, I'm not, for, I'm not seeing for the MRS. Let's talk about that. So you know ISCC, th this is a number one conference in the world for integrated circuit design. And all the important people from the field will come to San Francisco every year. It's not happening anywhere else. It's only in San Francisco because it's a Silicon Valley. For uh, any other conferences, international conferences, it happens all over the place in the world. But this one, Silicon Valley only. Um, and it's super difficult to get a paper published, even though it's just a conference paper. It's probably the number... Uh, one, uh, you know, a difficult place to publish any kind of research paper. I mean, many years ago, I, what I heard was uh, because integral circuit design by that time in China was not that advanced, maybe just 10, 15 years ago. So for the old mainline China, all the researchers are only getting two, pub, two papers to this conference every year. Uh, so Macau has a pretty good program on that. So they got one or two papers to this conference every year. High but now I think... High impact factor? High impact factor, yeah. So I think the Tsinghua University in China, maybe they are getting like five to 10 a year right now, but but they are having like 30 to 500 papers a year from the everywhere from the, from the world. I think the US is getting the most. So a lot of great tutorials and uh, workshops. I think the college will support like up to a thousand or 2000 bucks. And I can, I'm, I'm willing to pay something from Auto Strobe or something else if you want to go. To yeah, it's a, it's a week long conference. That would be awesome. Yeah. yeah. The CEO of like AMD, Intel, and Apple, they'll just give a talk. It's, it's just the best in the world. We got in the elevator with some of the VPs from Intel. I just started uh -huh. chatting with them because I was bored. It's funny to realize when you're walking out. <laughs> yeah. But are likely, I don't know, if you, you can look at the schedule. Maybe, Morris Zhang from TSMC or mm -hmm. other people, the, yeah. <clears throat> it's just a week-long conference will, <laughs> yeah. you know, probably have a lot of homework to, to work on anyway, but just, yeah, it's just important. Like that was the worst part about okay, just to let you guys know, um, there will be two conference trips in one next week, one this weekend, one in uh, mm -hmm. February. Um, but the good thing about this class is I have all the materials and tutorials already uploaded to the website and before the trip I'm gonna make it super clear on the expectations and assignments for it to turn on a uh, turn in uh, at a certain point of time. So for example this week um, this is a tutorial and homework 2 is due 
Thursday at 11 15 a.m., which is next Thursday. <laughs> Um, I think I already listed all the tasks in the email I sent to you guys, right? Two days ago. So tomorrow, tomorrow the uh, lab one report will be due, okay? And homework one is due this Thursday, okay? Any questions before we move on? Yes. Lab two is pretty simple. Let me see. So here's the date of the lab two, which is uh, on Thursday, right? So we'll have a lab, and we'll talk about the lab really quick. I think most of you already did it in in logic, but not everyone. Um, I think I still need to go through this so you know we can uh, can remind you how to uh, download the code into the memory on the chip on board instead of through the USB. Okay. So after the quick lecture, we'll have a five minute break and then we'll do the quiz. So I already listed all the commands on the paper. So my printer is broken. I have to get a new printer. So I'm gonna select several commands from these ones. <laughs> uh, 10 out of 20, okay, randomly. I'll let you work on that. And probably 10 points for each is 100 points for the quiz. Very you basic operations. The ones you pick, or do you want us to actually screen record it? I'll, I'll just tell you. I'll just ask you. For example, you type three lines in them, and I'll ask you to copy it, paste it, insert, or you know, do whatever. You have to do very basic operations. Uh, so that's the plan for today and this week. Okay. So data types, uh, fixed point representation, and we want to talk about the Q format or Q notation first. Uh, it's UQ, U means unsigned, it's unsigned Q notation. It's just basically telling you how many bits you want to put in the, in the data format or in the computer. It's, 16.6, 16 means the integer part will be 16 binary bits, and the fractional part will be 16 bits as well. So if you have 14, the decimal number 14.125, okay? If you convert it to a binary number without thinking about the UQ 16.16 .16 format, you are probably writing a number like this in binary, okay? 14 is, you know, 15 minus one, which is one, 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 zero, right? And one, two, five, it is point zero, zero, one. How do you know that really quickly? How could, could you find out zero point one, two, five is zero point zero, zero, one in, in binary? Yeah? It's one eighth, right? Yeah? So it's going to be 2 to the negative third power, which, which is moving the decimal number to the left by three times. So we are getting 0 0.001. Does that make sense? OK. And then you convert this number into a 16.16 .16 format. Very simple, just uh, adding uh, zeros in front of this number until it's forming 16 bits. And also adding um, that 13 more trailing zeros after this number, you are getting 16 numbers for the uh, fractional part as well. So it becomes, finally it becomes a hex number format will be 00E. So that hex digit Hexadecimal digit will be the four binary bits over here. So it's zero, 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 and E. All right. Point two, zero, zero, zero. So that's the fixed point 
UQ 16.16 format. Okay. Uh, for the signed, okay, so we are not talking about the uh, tools complement. Don't want to make it too complicated uh, here. So if we are just adding a one in front of it to make a negative number, it's a very simple format being used many years ago, but not too often now. So um, if it's it's a signed number, okay, it has a negative sign in front of it. For example, like this number, negative 14.125. And the format, the Q notation, you have to remove the U in front of it because it's not unsigned anymore. It's a signed Q format, uh, 15 point. So if you have a 15 point notation, and you are ignoring all the digits after the point. So it's only um, this number, but adding a one in front of it. So the computer knows that one represents a negative sign, but it's not a number. You know, but otherwise, so you, you definitely have other ways to represent the next number, like uh, tools complement. Okay, but for example, we are not using tools complement. You have to put a one in front of it to let the computer know this is a negative number. Okay, so the first bit, the MSB, is not a number; it's just a sign, which makes the total integer the, the number of bits to uh, become fifteen instead of sixteen. So that's why it's a Q fifteen. Uh, notation, but you are losing the fractional part, okay? If it's assigned Q15.16, it's a signed number, and you are all still missing one bit, the MSB as a number, so you are using that MSB as a sign, uh, but you can add the fractional part after the uh, decimal point, as a binary point. So you are getting this number, um, it's exactly 0 0.125, so you are not losing any precision here. So that's how you use these three notations, UQ 16.16, Q 15 point, or Q 15.16. So these are three examples, and if you want to look at more details, I have a few pages from, uh, from the textbook you can look at. So not too long, just three pages. Floating point representation. So floating point for all the non-integer uh, numbers that we want to represent in the computer system. Um, are using a floating point representation. And there are three or uh, four formats. I think the starting from the second one is getting uh, becoming very complicated. <laughs> it's taking a lot of time just working on the numbers inside of IPGA, which I really don't prefer having you guys working on. Um, basically, you can you can take three weeks to work on the numbers, you know, do the calculations on the papers. I, I, I don't like it. So let's just get to know how to use it. I think we'll just work on the first one, the half, um, is that called half precision? Uh, half precision format, okay, or ha half precision or half format of the floating point. Um, so there are a few columns, uh, exponent bias, 15 bits. Oh, no, uh, 15 is the decimal number. Uh, we'll get into that very, very quick, but just look at the numbers really quick. So number of bits for the sign is one bit. Number of bits for the E, I'll show you what is the E in the floating format. And number of bits for F as a fractional part of it. Total bits will be 16, so this is important. So you, you need to know the half format or the half precision floating point format has 16 points in total. Okay, could you remember that for now, just for a moment. And now let's look at the example, okay. The, the floating point, all the binary numbers will be stored in the, in the memory as SEF. Okay, so SEF are all the binary numbers that eventually will be converted from the number you want to store in the, in the memory. Okay, 
So you guys all know that the, the computers are these are these are binary machines. They can only store one zeros, but not decimal numbers, right? So if you have a decimal number, you have to convert it to a certain format. So now we are talking about one of the formats we are using to convert that non-integer um, uh, decimal number into a binary number. Okay. This could be could be boring, but we are not doing too much of it. <laughs> so it's okay. All right. 14.125. So first you have to convert it into a binary number, which is pretty simple. Like everybody knows how to do it. Okay? That's step one. Step two, it's very similar to scientific notation, but you are not using 10, but you are using two because it's a binary system. So you move the digits until you see a one here, okay? One point, can just convert it to one point something from that binary number, okay, one point, whatever it is, times two to the, how many digits, um, this is the, how many times you moved the, uh, that, the binary points, the binary point uh, from the original number to this one point something number, okay, because from here to here you move the, the point to the left for three times, so you want to times eight to recover it. Could you remember that one in from logic? I remember doing it. I don't remember how to do it. Not floating, not floating format, but the. So for example, for uh, for the decimal numbers, okay, if we have. I didn't prepare the modern. I don't have to write anything on anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, but by looking at your faces, I oh, forgot what are they. So look at the website for a Yeah, E is 15.6, so 3 is where that comes from. But where's the 15 come from? Oh, it's just a given, I see. I'm not going to. I got this. Yeah, what is... Because it, it, it went like really easy. Where did the 15 come from? The, it's like constant for the half precision. Do you still recall that if I have a decimal number like 125, for example, right, if I times 10, so the point was here, right, if I times 10, what's going to happen is it's going to move the, uh, move the point to the right by one bit, right, so I'm getting 1250, okay, if I move the if I divide by 10, I'm moving the point to the left, so I'm getting 12.5. But in binary, it's different. Okay, if I have 1101, if I divide by 2, so what is, num what is the number, what's the result if I divide by this number by 2? It's going to be 110.1, 1, right? If I have 1101 1, times 2, so we're getting 11010, 1, 1, right? That's how it works in binary. You'll still recall that. So you're operating using tens, but here is two. Times two divided by two. Right. So that's why if you move the digit 
uh, you move the point to the left by three times, you have to times two by three times, okay? And this number is, is E. This exponent here is E. You know what I mean? So the computer has a hardware to convert that number, that decimal number into something. So it's extracting E, extracting the sign, extracting the fractional number, and put them together as a no uh, unsigned binary numbers. The binary number is not representing th that, digital, that decimal number anymore. It's just being converted into a different format. So is the reason for doing this is just more memory efficient? So you can store it in 16 bits? Or? I mean, you can, you can store the number in all different ways. I think this is just the one way to do that. It's like, like a code, I think. Like BCD is, is a different code, right? So the floating point is another uh, code. It may save the memory a little bit if you have a super large number, right? So you are using the exponent instead of uh, the real number of digits. That's a good question, actually. I think you are right. Yeah. So E is going to be the exponent here, right? So the fractional F will be the real binary numbers here, but you are not converting this back to um, something. You are directly just using all these digits and putting F. Does that make sense? And then you com eventually combine S, E, and F into a binary number and store in the memory. So now we know how to how to get E, right? What about S? Yeah, it's a sign, right? So this is a positive number, so it's a sign zero, right? So keep in mind, you have to add a 15, which is a bias. And you'll see why do we have to use a bias. Exponent bias, it's just like an all offside number. It's like a baseline, you have to add to it to form E. Okay, just keep in mind, just simply add to 15. So three is the exponent, right? So add it to 15, you're getting 18. And convert 18 to a binary number, and that's gonna be E. So this is what we do here. So E equals 15 plus three. The reason we need, we need a baseline is because sometimes the exponent can be a negative number. If you don't have a baseline or offside, you're getting into trouble. You know what I mean? So we got a 15 is a positive number. If you have a negative number as an exponent, you can still minus uh, something from, you know what I mean? And F, you directly just to copy all these digits, the fractional part of it. Why is that four more zero? Yeah, because you have to form uh, 10 bits. It's a requirement for the format. So if you don't have uh, enough bits for it, just adding, just add trillion zeros. So it's not affecting the number. Um, if it has, what about, you know, the fractional part of it has 11 bits already. What do we have to do? Just trim the very last one, right? Doesn't matter how many bits you have. You have 100 bits, you just keep the, the first 10 bits, okay? So eventually, x, which is the number, the floating point number being stored in the memory, becomes SEF. So s is the sign, which is 0. And e is 18, because it's a 3 plus 15, the, off, uh, the offside. So eventually, it's 18, which is 10010. Uh, make sure e is 5 bits. So you have to convert that number into a 5-bit binary number here. That's the e. And F is a 10-bit fractional number. And you, you know, combine the first of four bit. So you want to keep the groups of four um, binary bits. So are getting a, a hex number here as a result. So 4B10, okay, as a 16-based number, binary number here. So now you'll see another example is the same number, but have a negative sign in front of it. So in that case, the sign becomes one. Okay, that's the only thing you want to change. But keep all the other, the rest numbers the same. Uh, but eventually the hex number becomes CP10. Is that clear? So for this negative number, is your exponent 
positive or negative? So when you are going to get a negative exponent from for e, so so the numbers the actual not e because you have a, a offset right will eventually bring it to a, to a positive number. But when you are getting a negative exponent, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So when the number is less than one, right? So for example, this one, 0 0.125, you don't have an integer in front of it. So if you convert this one into a binary number, it is 0 0.001 as a binary number, right? And you have to move this one to here by moving the point to the right by three times. Okay, so you have to times two to the negative third power here. So the exponent becomes negative three. And to, so luckily you have an offset here, so you have 15 minus 3, giving you 12. I convert 12 into a binary number, which is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. It must be 5 bits, because that's a requirement for that half precision, 14-point format, 5 bits. And the fractional part is just all zeros, right? After you convert it into 1.0 times 2 to the negative third power, I have all zeros left on the right-hand side of the the point. So it's all zeros. So the floating point number becomes zero as a sign because it's a positive number and the E here and F. So eventually it is three zero 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 in in hex. Any questions by far? No they're good? Okay. So there is a software online that I can test as a calculator and verify your result. Uh, but when you write it on the paper for the homework assignment, you need to show the process, how you convert it into a floating point. And now you actually just use a calculator <laughs> and just read the answer on the paper, okay? So another example here, if it is 3.141, and I'm asking you to convert this decimal number into a half precision floating point number format. So what is the first step would be? So 3.141. Let's start, let's start thinking about like in-class exercise, right? So now a um, decimal number is given. 3.141, okay? And we're being asked to convert into its floating point format, half precision. So what what is the first step? Yeah, change it to binary, right? Okay. Second, move the point. Scientific notation <laughs> in binary, okay? And then you can get E, right? By counting how many times you move the points to either left or right. And using that number plus what? To get E. Plus 15, which is offset, right? Or bias. So you are getting E. So F is pretty simple because F is just all the numbers after the point, right? So how many numbers, how many digits do you want to collect from that fractional part? Hmm? 10. Okay. So to form a half precision floating point format, you need a SEF, right? So you already have E and F, S is just a sign, which is zero for this case. Then you're done. So you can use a, I'm not expecting you guys to get a 10 digits on paper for, we will still remember how to convert a decimal number to binary, all the division by two all the times. So I'm gonna, I won't ask you to do that on the paper. So you can directly use the calculator. Uh, I used this decimal to binary converter, right? So I just directly put the 3.141 in there. It's giving me the binary number. Okay, if I move this point to the left, okay, so I will let, I'll ask you, so what is the E here? For this case, don't look at your monitor. So what is the E? Hmm? 
No, we have to add 15, right? 16. Okay. So what is F? Just 10 bits after the first one, right? Okay, starting from the second bit and counting for 10 bits. So what is uh, S? Zero, okay? So now you are getting that floating point half precision format. Pretty simple, right? That's it. S, E, F. And don't forget to convert it into hex. So you are forming a four digit hex number. So how many binary bits are in the four digit hex number? Freshman classroom, quiz classroom. 16, right? So four binary bits for each hex. ASCII code, super simple, like all the keys on your keyboard uh, represents a code. Uh, if you are using 8-bit, what is that, 8-bit? Yeah, it's an 8-bit. So it's an 8-bit code for each key on the keyboard. So uh, towards the end of the semester, you are going to use a keyboard uh, to communicate with your monitor using the IPG board. So you are basically designing a little keyboard USB controller. Um, so it's transmitting ASCII code to your IPGA, and then you relay it to your monitor. So um, you don't have to remember or memorize all the digits, but you definitely have a table to look at it. So for example, if I press the the at, the at sign, when you send an email, the at sign on the keyboard, what is the ASCII code of it? Four zero, right? Okay. So we'll have to look at the MSB first. So the MSB will be uh, these digits, and LSB will be the lower four bits, right? So this one is four and zero. So it's zero X for zero. So what about E, letter E? Hmm? Four, five. four, five, right? So E is four, five. So when you press something on the keyboard, you're expecting that binary number to be sent through the keyboard, through the USB. Okay, is that clear? Okay. Data types, we talked about that a little bit last week. Here are, some, here are more details. Register type is a one bit data, but you can definitely make a, um, it's called a bus, dig, digital, digital bus, right? You have a, a bundle of digits um, for any number of bits in there for the register, for the wire, you know, depends on your application. Okay, these are pretty straightforward. So let's look at the example here really quick. Okay. Module and module. How many modules do I have in this in this code? Two. So one is a digital block, another one is a test bench. Okay. Could you tell me what is this block doing here? It doesn't have any operations, it's just assigning parts of the number to a variable, right? And then display it. So these are very simple assignment, right? Just assign this to here, just assign this uh, a part of the num number one data to here. Uh, and the third one will be the entire number one, eight bits to this variable. So it has four, how many inputs? One input and three outputs. So for the digital design, for this digital block, it has one input, how many bits are in that input? Eight bits. And then you have three outputs, three outputs, right? So this output has how many bits in there? One, and this one, four, and this one, okay? So you can uh, flip it. You are actually assigning its LSB. 
is the MSB in in the in the number. They are just rotating all the numbers. Okay. Um, so zero bit zero becomes the MSB. Okay. So you are testing all the numbers in in all the memory banks. Uh, because you have an input in the digital in this digital block, so for your test bench, you definitely need to assign something to the input in order to see something, right? So you got you got an input for the chip. So in the test bench, you definitely need to fit something to the input to look at it. Okay. Since you are assigning something to it in the simulation, it has to be a register type. That makes sense. Remember, you have to store a number into it. That's why you are using this one uh, in the initial begin statement. So you are assigning something to let us store this number you put in the simulation. So that's the A bit hex number, and that is FA, which is four ones, and A is 10. That's going to be 1010. It's the A bit binary number, or A bit, um, it's actual hex number, but that's here's a quick quiz question. So if I'm saying A bit, here, right? A prime HFA. Am I having eight bits of binary digits or hex digits? Hmm? Yeah. So don't get confused. Even though you have an H there, I'm just writing that number in the hex format, but I'm, it's not representing an eight bit of hex digits. So I'm not having like A, F, A, E, D, all this stuff. It's just a bits of binary numbers, but I'm just writing that number in the hex format. You know what I mean? So F A, so a bits. All right, and then delay for hundred what? Hmm. A hundred what? Nanoseconds. Nanoseconds, because I have a time scale already claimed on, on the on the very top of the page. So you can see that I can definitely put two modules in in one. V file without any problems. I can even have a test bench in there as well. So this is the name of the digital block, and here I, I include it into the test bench. So I have to keep the name exactly the same as this one. And I'm renaming this one as a unit under test, but I can name it a different name as well if you want. Doesn't matter. And these are the old connections. Okay. So another quick quiz question. So right after the dot. This signal is a signal from the test bench or the signal from the digital block? Right after the dot, is this one from the this guy or from the test bench? Yeah, from the unit. From the unit under test. Keep in mind, right? It's confusing, very confusing a lot of times because if you look at a lot of examples on a test book, somewhere else, from the menus, they will use the same name. So what if you have da in parentheses in? You need to know which one's which, right? Okay. So make all the connections and run the simulation in Vivado, and I can look at the bits being stored in the inputs and outputs. So are you expecting? These, digit, uh, these signal lines to be the signal from the test bench or from the digital block? Test the bench. You are not able to see the signal lines from the from the block. It's not visible. It's a different layer, right? So test the bench, it's a um, different hierarchy now. So it's the outer layer of the, of the design block. It's not the internal digital block. Okay. And there are a few um, assignments for uh, different operations of the digital logic. Pretty simple. Structural modeling, behavioral, um, data flow, which you have to include the assign in front of it, and it's just line by lines, one, one liner. Okay, behavioral can include the multiple lines in it, um, being wrapped up by beginning and end. Right, structural is just a, a keyword in front of it, it's and represents an logic. And the first one, the first argument is the output, and the following ones are the inputs. 
lookup tables that what the IPGA chips use uh, internally. Oh, we don't have an assignment regarding that. It's just some internal structure of it. So this is less important. Okay. Um, number seven will be some simple combinational logic design on the IPGA. We may have to run some simulations first before we put it onto the upload it to the IPGA. Okay, for example, a very simple home alarm system. Okay, so S0, S1, S2, S3. So what is the gate here? For what? What is the gate? Four input OR gate. Okay, that's a two input AND gate. Okay, so these sensors are being mounted to the window, to the door, to like another window, another door, right? Which driver is being triggered? Which means someone is trying to break into the house. It's gonna give a one to it, okay? Because that's an OR gate, so if you got a one, it's gonna trigger a, it's gonna assert, that's what we say. It's gonna assert that output, will give a one to the output. For anyone, right? So anyone becomes a one, it's gonna give, give a one to the output of the OR gate, okay? And then through the AND gate, I'm able to, you know, either turn on the alarm or turn on the light. Okay, a flashing light. But you have another input with the M. So what is the M doing here? <coughs> yeah, it's a switch. So if you put a one, you are gonna enable the AND gate. If you put a zero, it's disabling the AND gate. Okay. It's very simple. Can we just um, write a Verilog code um, and let me see if we want to run a simulation or a IPGA. Oh, it's IPGA, okay. So I'm gonna go through this example really quick and I'll let you guys uh, practice on the, on, the, on the next one, okay. So for the digital block, I just have to write a code to represent this digital circuit. So imagine if you have to grab a or, four input OR gate from the lab, in, uh, from the drawer in the lab, and another AND gate, and you put it on the on the breadboard and connect all the signals from the function generator and, and to probe, have to add a switch here as well and probe it using a, a oscilloscope. So you also design a little um, alarm system, but using all the bench top equipment and function generators. So that will take you a lot of time to do it, right? But now we just read the code and it's gonna synthesize the netlist and can directly impl implement it onto the IPGA. So you can actually build a circuit really quickly. You won't be able to see that because everything's in the chip, but it can definitely make a hardware out of it really quickly on the IPGA. So here's the digital design. It's a module, definitely it's a module and you have to put an module at the end. So I have definitely four inputs of um, S. So it's an input S with four inputs and one bit input M as a switch, and output is just a one bit. So that's a digital block. And just directly write the, uh, write down the digital uh, the logic operation using combinational logic uh, operators. As an or, 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 and parentheses, and M. And assign the result to output. Okay, very simple. So I'm asking you guys to use the uh, command line and GVM to create a, a .v file. The reason to do that is for a digital hardware design, it's not necessary for, for software engineering, it's just pure coding, but whenever hardware is involved, you have to collaborate on the server, okay? So in the future, on the first day in the, in the, in the company, you probably have to use the Linux system and everybody log into the system, use the simulators from the from the server, okay? So it's gonna be Linux and it's gonna be Vim everywhere. Um, yes, everything. Our currency is a VI, yeah. Yeah, it's just a industry standard. If you haven't used it, definitely highly recommend it. It may be on the interview. <laughs> so, so probably 25% of the interview questions are on Linux and Vim. If you are uh, trying to find a digital design job, it's gonna be Vim, Linux, 
uh, taking either 25% uh, or 10% of the interview questions, very likely. So um, here's, a, here's a module, right? Here's the module, and here's the test bench. So it looks slightly different from the ones we used last week, because this is not simulation anymore. It's a real world physical board as a test bench. I think I talked about this in the lab really briefly uh, on Thursday last week. So which means the switch and LED, these are keywords, you cannot rename them. Make sure that we are not doing a simulation, you understand that, okay? It's not a simulation anymore. So the test bench itself right now, it's gonna be the chip on the IPG board and those are the peripherals, like the switches, keep, uh, the display modules, push buttons. So the name of the switch is called SW. It has 16 bits, 16 switches on it. And the name of the LED is just LED. And it's case sensitive. I think I intentionally made, a, made an error in the constraint file in the lab, but not in the tutorial of the lecture tool of this lecture. So in the lab's uh, constraint file that I can download from my website, it has a uppercase LED. Make sure you are you have to correct it <laughs> before you you can you know run it. So it has to be they have to be consistent. If you use LED here and in the constraint file being used to program your IPGA it has to be LED as well, lowercase. So switch SW and lowercase LED, and they have to be lowercase and exactly whatever I have here. I cannot change the name of it. Okay. So for input. Uh, because switches are input, you cannot make switches at output. You know, it's not a display module or something else. It's just a switch. And outputs, the LEDs are outputs because it's receiving a signal. It's being lighted up or being uh, shut off, right? It's, it's just a, it's a display part. So LEDs are definitely outputs. So switches are inputs. You switch it on, you're giving an input, uh, one to the input, okay? And you have 16 bits for the switches, but we are only using five bits. It's fine, you can use all the 16 bits, it's okay. It's not going to affect the results. But I'm just using four bits uh, of it, the lower uh, five bits, I'm sorry. I'm just using the lower five bits, which is bit four to bit zero of the switch. What about this one? Zero to zero, what is that? Yeah, just the LSB, right? Just the LSB of the, 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 L, the LED. Just only one LED is being used. And now I'm making connection, right? It's a very similar format. It's a home alarm, had to be the same name as this module. I include it into the test bench and I rename it as a unit under test. And dot A will be the signal line inside the module, inside the unit. And this will be the LEDs bit and this is uh, four bits of the switch is being used for the four bits of the S signal in the digital module. And the fourth, the, uh, the fifth bit of the switch is being used at the control module. So the MSB of the switch is actually a, a switch for the alarm. Do you imagine what I'm talking about right now? Um, Take a look at it. Okay, so I'm talking about the switches. How many switches do we have over here? Don't count it. 16, I already told you. <laughs> 16 switches. Okay. Which switches we used in a, a Verilog file we just look at? What are the switches we are going to use? The lower five, right? Lower five. So, which is going to be the control, uh, the the control bit of the alarm system? Yeah, it's about four, right? Yeah. So the fifth from the right. Okay. So these will be the triggers. Okay. You are imagining these will be connected to the sensor, and um, so if you switch it on, it's a sensor signal from the door, from the window, or something, right? So which LED is being used as the alarm result or indicator? Could you tell? Which LED is being used as an indicator, as output of the alarm system? LED zero, right? Which is this guy? 
That's a little surface mount LED. Okay, 0603. So if um, let's think about that. So for example, the code has already uploaded to the IPGA. Okay. Now I want to demonstrate that the alarm system is working or not. So what you want to do first? Mm, turn on search for, right? Oh, we're here, right? Okay. Then our, so if you turn on switch four, are you expecting this one to be turned on or not? No. Then what? Switch on one of them, right? Or two of them, or four of them, doesn't matter. See if LED will be on, okay? And you also have to verify that if you keep it off, if you switch this off, and then you switch one of these or all of them on, if the LED will be on. Will the LED be on or, or not? No, because you turn off the alarm system by switching off the uh, SW4, okay? Any questions on that? Easy? Okay. Any questions on the code? How to write the test bench for that, for IPGA? Is that clear? There are se several other steps to include the constraint file and other uh, things to the to the Vivara, but they are, these are trivial tasks. So the main things are writing the digital module and the uh, test bench for the IPGA. Uh, so the following snapshots shows you all the steps, how to include the uh, files and synthesize it, implement it, generate bit string files and upload it to the IPGA. And eventually it should show the results like this. And I have specific requirements in the in the tasks you can you can read. Uh, it's slightly different from the the ones we used last uh, last year. So I'm asking you guys to show a demonstration demonstrating demonstration video, like switch on this one, like what we said, right? Just switch this on and no lights are on, and I turn on one of the uh, S. Just gonna turn on the LED, right? So you wanna do the demonstration and then describe it, right? It's like a little very short presentation. Right. Describe it in the video or like they're covering the video, yeah. In the video? Yeah, yeah. Also write something as well. Yeah. Like results for the demonstration. Okay. Digital safe system. I think this is a password matching system. So these are XOR gates. So for the XOR logic, if so what XOR gate does? So if I'm doing an interview, like asking asking you like what XOR gate does? Yeah, exclusive or it only turns on when one's on, one one can or the other. Hmm. No? Like different, different one. Yeah. Yeah, so the twins are different. You are getting a one. If they are same, you are getting a zero. Just... No, you said. <laughs> I said if one or the other was on, but not both, or I guess both off. Oh, yeah, yeah, similar, right? Okay. So it's just detecting the difference, right? So if they're the same, you are getting a zero. If they're different, you are getting a one. Okay. It seems like a, it no. And what is it? You put it two or on. You can have. Well, it's just when one is on. When, when, we, when there's only one. one. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good thing to look at. So we can use a four XOR gaze to detect a match. A password match. So some user is trying to type a, type a password for a system. Also, only when they match, it's uh, outporting a zero, uh, a one. Wait, zero, right? And then it gets inverted. It's got inverted. It's got a one, right? You want to use a one for the end gate. That's why I want to invert it. Otherwise, you're getting a zeros. Any zeros will disable the the end gate. So the idea is. If, for example, if you look at the first XOR gate, if they are if they match, you are getting a zero, zero being inverted, you got a one. Okay. So only when all the outputs are ones, you are getting a one for the end gate. If you got a zero, one of them becomes zero, it's gonna kill the end gate and give you give you a zero. So it's not matching, showing you that it's not it doesn't match. So it's a password matching system or detect uh what do you want to call it? 
digital safe system okay so it's a system that we don't allow the user to 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 program the password <laughs> it's embedded into the system you won't sell it well you know on amazon but so we we hard we program into the hardware so this, the password is 0101 as a parameter is a constant so the hardware is holding that that parameter the password so we let the user type a four-bit binary number as a password from p0 to p3 okay so we need an input since we since all the s these are parameters that are constants in the system so we are not actually using p using p as an input uh, but the user is is typing a four-bit binary number in there trying to match p okay so for the digital system we only need a one uh, input it's a four-bit input and one output it's two-bit output because one is used as the indicator another one is why do we need the two bits here so considering that we are connecting these two bits into two LEDs on the board so why do we want a two why do we want a two signal lines instead of one right it's just inverting it why do, do you think two is better than one so if I mean I'll let you think about it for one more second think about it yeah wh why do we Very close, yeah. Think about if you have a board, right? You are trying to verify your password, okay? So you try to, a, a, a few different options. It's always off, so you won't really know if your board is really part up or if something else is, is messing up the uh, your result, right? So you don't know is is it uh, incorrect the password or the IPGA is is down or something else is power is not going through or something else right so if you have another led indicating that so you're getting a zero one for example so you know the password is wrong but the power is okay all right so whenever you get a correct password it's just going to flip toggle the two lights so you'll, you'll see a very clear result well i will have a uh, very quick break and i'll let you guys maybe don't look at the uh, the monitor and just type your digital design block and test the bench by yourself. It's part of the homework assignment, so you are not wasting your time. Let's do it. And just this one. Yeah, just design a system, right? Don't look at the code on the monitor and just try to type it. So have a break and come back. We'll have probably five to 10 minutes, let you guys to type um, type the code into your VIM, right? Five minute break. <laughs> So we'll come back at 21, 12, 21, okay? Is there like a convenient XOR character, or do you have to part, like write out the whole XOR character? Oh, okay. Favorite Dr. Lee, do you have a favorite Jeevan font? You should randomly pick up one of them. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite is the Lucidity Lucida console right now. Mm -hmm.
not just an exclamation point. Oh. Do you know what the actual name of that character is? Tilda? I think that's that one. I used to call it the bacon symbol. The bacon? 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 It looks like a squiggly piece of bacon. Uh, Do you have to do three colon zero or can you do zero colon three? Do both work? Three column zero. Interesting. In Python, everybody does it the opposite. Way. So I'm used to the two or the three. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you. 